in crossing cases in diabetic retinopathy and medical retina session one and uh, due to uh, conflict of uh, some scheduling uh, we will be calling one uh, dr shilpi narnarware first on the dais she will be presenting her uh, case that is wandering ped dr shilpi please How old was she? I'm sorry again. 55. So uh, you had her angiograms. Yes. You showed some angiograms. Fluorescent. Yes. ICG was done. ICG was done. Any polyps? No. Fluorescent I saw was very non-specific uh, hypoplasia. Um, so what is the possible etiology? Could it be a, just a pachychoroid with a kind of CSR picture? Yes. Yes. Possibly it's just a uh, non-specific pachychoroid spectrum uh, where like CSR she develops fluid. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would have to agree that this case is never reported such a case. So that would be a very good case present, a case report. Um, I, I just believe it's a pachychoroid spectrum. And you, you're just lucky that she's getting away without treatment. I've never seen such a patient. I mean, we have to give them either aflibercept or Ozodex or something to get resolution. So uh, very, very uh, rare, not reported. 
not at all reported. So, congratulations on the case. Bilateral. Was she on steroids every time she had this? Was she asthmatic or allergic? She is non-diabetic, non-hypertensive. Any hormonal therapy, postmenopausal? She had glaucoma? She had glaucoma? Yeah, she was operated for uh, glaucoma surgery. And after that only she developed. See, glaucoma does cause hypotony maculopathy, but it doesn't cause RP detachments. Yeah. It can cause choroidal detachments. Yeah. And then they wouldn't go unless the hypotony was addressed. There was no hypotony in no. this patient. Uh, I just, I think it was just a pachychoroid, but has to be reported. Um, only thing we need to rule out is use of steroids or any... Uh, hormones, postmenopausal uh, replacement therapy. Those things can uh, cause CSR like leakage. Excellent. A rare case report of BRAO in a young girl with coagulopathy, Dr. Priyanka. Dr. Deepthi Kulkarni, peekaboo with anemia. Please come, doctor. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, all okay. of you organizers, Thank for you. having me be a part. I'd like to discuss or rather open up a discussion for uh, under discussed topic of, uh, or that is retinopathy uh, which occurs in anemia. I'll first present a couple of my cases here. This is the first case mm. where uh, yeah, this was a young female, 24 years old. She complained uh, of a rather discomfort or uh, some irregularity while she was studying. She had no particular symptoms. The vision was 6 by 6 in both eyes, 6 by 6 and N6. And there were no changes on ampullar grid for self-testing that we advised her on the same day. And no other uh, abnormality seen except for mild tortuosity of the vessels. This was uh, the picture on pass OCT. We don't have an octa, so this is an on pass OCT that we have. And there, were, there was nothing specific that we could point to which would uh, explain the tortuosity of the vessels in that eye. On the day two, she said that her symptoms had increased. Now we could see that there was a deep hemorrhage uh, just inferonasal to the macula and a blot hemorrhage uh, around developing uh, just temporal to it. At this stage, uh, I thought that it was an impending CRBO and thus gave her an antivagus on the same day. Uh, the perifoveal hyperreflectivity uh, confirmed with my findings of uh, evolving ischemia in this macula. The next day, that is day five, after receiving the injection also, she came where the, this large hemorrhage had developed uh, temporal to the fovea. Her vision was still six by six. I had, in the meanwhile, I had asked her to evaluate for her blood profile, where her hemoglobin came out to be 7.5. And uh, in general, there were uh, all parameters of uh, microcytic uh, anemia present. Uh, the hematologist gave a diagnosis of iron uh, deficiency anemia with reactive thrombocytosis. This is two months post-injection and one year post-injection. Uh, we can see that the tortuosity had gradually decreased and her vision had been 6-6 since day one and it was preserved even later. Around the same time, I had another case where this was again a young okay. female, 17 year old, who had a vision of 6 by 6 in the right eye, 6-6 six, six parts in her left eye where she could read, but she said there was disturbance when she was studying. And here we can see that there is a branch retinal occlusion that we can see and she then eventually complained of a black spot while she was reading, when she was trying to focus. Uh, these are her findings on OCT and uh, on pass. Uh, in her case too, her hemoglobin came out to be 9.2. On, pro on probing further, she said that she had an even lower hemoglobin and was being treated for anemia. The same uh, findings here too, all, uh, all findings of, microci of microcytic hypochromic anemia. And uh, she also um, uh, developed a good, good vision after treatment. She did not... Uh, she was not willing to receive antivages, so we had not injected anything in her. Now, uh, we have a large 
number of young girls in our society too who have an anemia ranging from 4 hemoglobin to 9 hemoglobin who are perhaps going on about their daily work but we don't see them often in uh, our opds we discuss anemia along with other factors like diabetes or hypertension or other factors but anemic retinopathy per se is perhaps not being ad- ad- addressed enough now are there any ocular factors that can tilt it towards developing anemic retinopathy or developing vascular occlusions like this we are familiar with seeing other findings of anemia this is another case where the it was a young gentleman who had anemia and uh, he developed this uh, hemorrhage on valsalva what would have uh, been the cause of retinal changes is if the antivegf was not given in the first day or it was deferred till uh, the vision dropped what would have been the change in this uh, the course of these disease and would a systemic management uh, if it was more aggressive to in the treatment of anemia will it al- alter the course of these disease this is what i would like to ask our esteemed panel here um also uh, along al- i discussed this with an immunologist and who studies a lot about uh, liquid cancer he said that af- while treatment of anemia during the course of treatment uh, just like we get reactive uveitis there is a reactive thrombocyto uh, th- thrombocytosis and that is when uh, there are coagulative uh, symptoms are seen all everywhere else in the body so that is the time that we can develop these uh, symptoms in the eye also so is there something that we can do to prevent this or address this yeah uh, so uh, doctor one thing is it's not that the treatment of anemia causes thrombocytosis the reason anemia is causing uh, vascular occlusions is because it anemia causes thrombocytosis, thrombocytosis and it also damages the endothelium from hypoxia the vascular endothelium which leads to occlusion so anemia itself is enough it does not need treatment of anemia to cause thrombosis or um, these things um second uh, question was whether treatment uh, would have helped so yeah aggressive treatment of anemia has been known to reverse even the retinal arterial occlusion related vision loss because these are young patients these are not patients who have developed over years and cannot be reversed so these patients have a relatively good prognosis if the anemia is managed with supplementation iron uh, infusion uh, the third thing was that there are many reports of combined occlusions brao crvo as well as combined venous and arterial occlusions mm, but these are rare these are rare what we see is more commonly anemic retinopathy so i had a question uh, the first case you gave anti vegf yes, and you asked that if you had not given anti vegf what would have been the prognosis yes, i am wondering why anti vegf was given because this looks more like anemic retinopathy with vascular dilatation yes. uh, rather than crvo when there is no edema so i was wondering why you gave anti vegf and whether that made any difference ma'am this i gave anti vegf because i thought that this hemorrhage and this hemorrhage that was deep so it was that kind of an impending crvo and this she was a young patient can anti vegf prevent uh, crv no it might not prevent but at least the uh, balance between ischemia might be tilted somewhat in the favor of uh, so good vision gain and she already had fixed it and and fixed vision so possibly this is anemic retinopathy and possibly anti vegf did not make a difference uh, uh, anemia uh, causes a, a vast mm-hmm. changes in the retina and uh, yes, flame shaped hemorrhages uh, rot spots and many other things so just for hemorrhage i don't think that anti vegf injection is needed yes, what you told huh? and number one, number two we have two groups only isolated anemia or and another group as anemia with thrombo- thrombosis so the second group uh, i think if if it is there on hemogram that needs to be addressed aggressively yes. Uh, yes um yes uh, they said it was microcytic hypochromic anemia but that was when i said that not treatment of anemia but when the anemia is in the range of 7 to 9 or 10 uh, moderate anemia that's when uh, the immunologist says they are likely to develop such lesion then when it is really low be- below 6 where they will develop a full blown anemic retinopathy picture with rot spots and the angry looking kind of in fact anemia is known to cause strokes yes, even yes, uh, ischemic strokes yes. actually personally i had hemianopia and then when i investigated it uh I, my hemoglobin was 6 oh. that was some years back so my point is it does cause uh, uh ischemia uh, so ma'am can we attribute this tortuosity to just the anemic retinopathy or? causes tortuosity yes. it causes because of hypoxia there is tortuosity yes. so this is not crvo yet thank you thank you good good cases thanks
So uh, one important point from your presentation is when we see a case of retinal vascular occlusion, we should not look for just the conventional uh, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Anemia is never on our mind when we are thinking of vascular occlusions. That's a very important point. Munman Roy for diabetic retinopathy with VH and VG in PVD. Dr. Munman Roy. So next, uh, I'll request Dr. Alka Ravi to be present after after Dr. Munman. Be ready with her presentation. Okay, Dr. Alka. Yeah, okay, thank you. So uh, she will be presenting uh, Bartle uh, Biddle syndrome with typical retinitis uh, pigmentosa. Very good, good afternoon to all. Uh, my topic is Bardet Biddle syndrome from ophthalmology perspective. A eight year old girl presented to OPD at Jalit and CH Bhagalpur Bihar with the main complaint of poor vision for three years, especially at night in both eyes. Her medical history suggesting of she was a second child of full term vaginal delivery from a consanguineous marriage. According to her father, she is following up with pediatric clinic for assessing her with daughter's difficulty in swallowing, language delay, delayed milestones, polyuria, polydipsia, and progressive weight gain. Uh, there was no positive family history. Uh, upon general examination, the patient had some normal intelligence, central obesity, a moon like face, and some dysmorphic features like low hairline, depressed nasal bridge, and post axial uh, polydactyl. On ophthalmological assessment, uh, the best corrective visual acuity in right eye was uh, 6 by 60 and in left eye it was PL positive. Patient had nystagmus in both eyes and her refractive examination reveals myopic astigmatism with a very high uh, spherical power and cylindrical power. Uh, her fundus, uh, uh, fundus photograph shows a typical retinitis pigmentosa with pale optic disc and arterial attenuations and the bony spicules in the peripheral retina. As the patient had nystagmus, she was not able to focus on the OCT and her left eye uh, was uh, showing optic atrophy which was, uh, uh, which was done, uh, which has been seen through uh, indirect ophthalmoscope. Uh, basic lab work uh, workup including the complete blood count, fasting blood sugar, thyroid stimulating hormone and liver function test which was within the normal range but she had an elevated triglycerides. So we had ref uh, we referred the patient to higher center for genetic workup and a possible mutation consistent with uh, bardet Biddle syndrome. A thorough search of literature and with clinical findings our patient fits into the diagnosis of bardet Biddle syndrome. Uh, discussion. Uh, bardet Biddle syndrome is a rare autosomal recessive genetic disorder which leads to the dysfunction of multiple organ system including the kidneys, genitalia, brain and eye. It caused by the mutations of proteins involved in the cilium and the most commonly exhibited feature was uh, retinal rod cone dystrophy. Clinical confirmation can be done using a revised criterion that consists primary or major features and secondary or minor features. Primary features include hypogonadism, polydactyl, obesity, retinitis pigmentosa, and learning disability, whereas the secondary features include ataxia, speech abnormalities, developmental delay, and diabetes mellitus. Uh, according to this, uh, our patient had uh, central obesity, polydactyl, retinitis pigmentosa as primary features, and poor coordination and developmental delay as secondary features. Thus, it fits, uh, thus it established the diagnosis of bardet Biddle syndrome. Thank you. So what is, uh, what is it that you are trying to uh, bring out from this presentation? Is there anything in mind? Uh, no ma'am, there is nothing. Uh, I just want to present that, uh, I just want to report a case of bardet Biddle syndrome. She was presenting to our OPD. So ma'am, I have prepared this one. So there are many syndromes with retinitis pigmentosa. Yes, Some Usher's syndrome, Usher's which has hearing syndrome. abnormality. Lot of them with renal abnormalities. And there's a Lawrence Moon syndrome, which does not have polydactyly and obesity, but has other things. Yes, ma'am, like Lawrence Moon. Uh, Lawrence Moon, yeah. Yes, ma'am, Lawrence Moon. And then you can have both Lawrence Moon and Bardet Moon, Bardet where Bardet. you have everything. Yes, ma'am. So these are basically just an autosomal recessive uh, genetic disease, yes, which can be very severe. Um, they are not very uncommon in the South India, because consanguinity is so common in South India. 
So since I shifted to South India, I, I, we see a lot of these cases okay. uh, because they marry in their relationships. Yeah, there has to be an awareness. When we see such a patient, we have to talk to the family not to have consanguineous marriages in the future yes, at least. Sir. Anything anybody wants to add? For this rare genetic disorders, do we uh, do we uh, always need to do a genetic counseling, a genetic testing before being able to present on such podiums? Because everywhere on each case report, it is uh, told that uh, we didn't perform it. But when the symptoms are so uh, obvious, do we really need to do genetic testing, ma'am? See, uh, presenting in a podium like this where you don't have uh, much, you know, at stake. But if you are presenting at a place where you want to deliver a particular message with that case. Now here there is no particular message. I asked her what's the message. So if there's a particular message you want to deliver, there has to be a genetic subtype to say that this subtype causes this problem and hence we have to see whether other genetic subtypes also cause this problem. So when there is a... A, a firm message to be delivered. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, it has no bearing on treatment or management. So I don't think it should be done for any case at all. Unless we are planning particular treatment depending on the genetic type, which we don't have, except Luxterna, which is an intra-vitreal uh, gene therapy. Luxterna is done for a particular genetic subtype of retinitis pigmentosa. So for that, uh, they do a genetic typing, but we are not offering Luxterna to anybody. Thank you, Dr. Alka. Thank you. So Dr. Munman, has the presentation uploaded? Uh, Next, we will have Dr. Uh, Jenickson Jairaj with his case on uh, approach to a case of rectal vasculitis, a view through resident's eye, what to do, what and what not to miss. So after Dr. Munman, Dr. Jenickson, thank you. respected judges and all dear delegates. Today I am going to present a case study on bilateral diabetic retinopathy with vitreous hemorrhage, neovascular glaucoma and partial uh, vitreous detachment. There is also an old case of central retinal vein occlusion right eye and cystoid macular edema of the left eye. There has been no financial support and sponsorship for this case study. So as we all know, diabetic retinopathy is a condition of the retina caused by microangiopathy due to the long-term effect of chronic hyperglycemia. And this leads to the swelling of the retinal layers. So this was a case history of a 42-year-old female patient who reported to us at the OPD with diminished vision in both eyes right eye more than the left eye since three years, which was gradual in onset and progressive in nature. And uh, there is also associated mild constant dull aching pain in the right eye since one week. And she has also been complaining of wandering black spots on looking around in her right eye since five years. She is a known case of diabetes mellitus with hypertension. And uh, she gave a previous history of diminution of her vision in right eye four years back when she was diagnosed with CRVO and her vision had deteriorated to hand movement positive. She had already taken two doses of injection ranibizumab back then, one in either eye. So the visual acuity, present visual acuity of the patient was in her right eye, it was PL positive and PR positive. And the intraocular pressure was 66 millimeter of mercury in her right eye. On applanation tonometry, it was 52 millimeter of mercury. And on gonioscopy in the right eye, neovascularization of the angle was also seen. Uh, the conjunctiva was congested on slit lamp examination. The iris of the right eye had neovascularization at the pupillary border. The pupil was sluggishly reacting to light and lid dilated. And the anterior chamber was shallow with a 0.5 mm high femur seam. The rest findings of the left eye were within normal limits. So this was the picture of the right eye with the high femur and the lid dilated pupil with neovascularization of the iris. And the left eye was relatively normal. On IDO examination, we found that the right eye, the media was hazy due to vitreous hemorrhage and fibrous band was noted, so peronasal to the disc. A macular preretinal bleed was seen and hemorrhage in the vitreous cavity. 
the retinal vessels could not be visualized properly. On the other hand, in the left eye, the media was clear with multiple dot blot hemorrhages in all quadrants and hard exudates. So this was the picture of the left eye, the fungus photograph of the left eye. Which is the left eye? Which is the left eye. This was the left eye. And this was the picture of the right eye. Ma'am, uh, right eye had developed CRVO four years back. The right eye. This was the left eye. The picture. So this was the picture of the OCT picture of the right eye and the left eye. And an ultrasound B scan was done, uh, which showed a mild vitreous hemorrhage with posterior vitreous detachment. So we started the patient on anti-glaucoma medications, Zosoxy and Bignalest with uh, tablet IMOF, and steroids were uh, started with topine, and injection anti-VGF has been uh, given. Follow-up is being done for the patient, and the patient has been counseled for surgery. So uh, the discussion, rubiosis iridis is the neovascularization of the iris as we know with numerous coarse and irregular vessels on the surface and stroma of the iris. Many studies have already <coughs> been done on PVD in uh, neovascular glaucoma and uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And uh, we have concentrated mainly on this case in reducing the IOP and pain of the patient and then plan for intravitreal anti-VGF injections for reducing the neovascularization. So uh, on conclusion, uh, cases like this should remind us that diabetes and CRVO once diagnosed should be managed carefully with timely follow-up. Uh, as she had not uh, visited us uh, when she had been diagnosed with CRVO, so we do not know much of the details earlier. But this was the present picture when she came to us in the OPD. And any rise in the IOP should be strictly controlled. These were my references. Thank you. Doctor, you told that uh, your right eye was having a vision of PLPR yes. and the pressure was 66, yes, sir. something like that. So the picture what you showed uh, doesn't relate uh, to that vision, number one. And uh, what was the, uh, for what patient came to you? So diminution of vision, uh, she also had... Uh, Anything relating to pain or something like that? The pain was there, right so smile So what did you do for right eye? So we started, uh, she had already discontinued all the medications before. She was treated before she took injections, but then she discontinued the medication. Do you think that any injection will help the patient at the pressure of 70? Mm. So what would you do in this such cases? Uh, is anybody, your senior is here? Anybody who, you're a PG student, right? Yes. Sir. So anybody who's a ophthalmologist with you here so that we can discuss the case with them? Mm. No, okay. So uh, apart from the questions he asked, uh, what is very important in NVG is to know whether it's a closed angle or open angle, which you did not mention. Yes, because that changes the treatment. If it's already a closed angle neovascular glaucoma, you will of course give injection with a paracentesis and then proceed with surgery. See, ultimately the treatment for NVG is what? What is the treatment? What is the Anti treatment for NVG? Anti-VGF. No, anti-VGF is only temporary. It will last for two weeks, three weeks. Treatment is laser. Only laser, 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 and laser. And in addition, you may do an anterior retinal cryo. Now, when you already have vitreous hemorrhage, pressure is 66, laser will not go. So now your idea becomes, I have to operate, I have to remove this blood, I have to do laser during surgery as much as I can. And wherever I can uh, not do the laser, I will do anterior retinal cryo. That is your idea. So towards that, you may give an anti-VEGF so that the new vessels may regress in the first one week. And then you can operate safely, you can do that. But you'll have to do a paracentesis at the time of anti-VEGF, otherwise you can't even inject. Now, if you have not even seen whether the uh, angle is closed or open in the first few visits, you have to have an idea. If it's open angle, then just your laser and ARC will be enough. The angle will be enough to take care of the drainage because you would have taken care of the ischemia. Yes. But if the angle is already majorly closed, more than 50%, then you know that despite you treating with laser and ARC, patient will still need a glaucoma filtering surgery, for sure. Yes, 
So then you counsel accordingly, you plan accordingly. You do your surgery, you do a vitrectomy, you do your laser, but you're mentally prepared that pressure will not come down because angle is already closed. And then you are ready to refer them for a shunt surgery. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not possible to even, uh, if it's not possible to do anything, you can't even see, then you give an injection, anti vegger get the new vessels down, get a glaucoma filtering surgery done in the next two weeks when there are no new vessels, and then proceed with laser. Once the cornea clears, and if there is no vitreous hemorrhage, proceed with laser. But knowing whether the angle is open or not is very, is very important. So your case was good, but your message is not clear. I have one question. So the patient also had cataract. So at what stage would you do the cataract surgery? At this point, we, once the new vessels go, see, anti vegf has to be given to move yeah. next step. Yeah. Once you've done that, you can even handle the cataract if you feel that that is going to obstruct your laser treatment or the vitrectomy. But if you feel it's not obstructing your current treatment, then it could wait. But once the new vessels have gone with an anti vegf you can do cataract surgery as well. If you can do a glaucoma filtering surgery, you can do a cataract as well. Any, anybody in the audience has any query about NVG or diabetic retinopathy? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Murman. And next we will call upon Dr. Jenickson with his presentation on approach to a case of retinal, retinal vasculitis. Uh, what a resident uh, what should and should not miss. Yeah, when do we finish? 20 minutes more. You let us know. So just ring something, no, when there's a four minutes is over. Audio visual? Four yeah, minutes. Four minutes. So you have 20 more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Five, five minutes. So we'll stop discussing later. So we have three or four presentations left with 15 minutes. We have to go fast and minimize discussion also. Are all other three speakers there? Dr. Kapoor, Mukherjee, and uh, Abhishek. Are all there? One, two, only two? Dr. Shivangi Kapoor? Oh, so three, all three are there. It's a tough. I think we didn't do any time management. Okay, next speaker, if they are ready, please come. Next speaker. Yeah. Okay, next speaker, yeah, please. Doctor, you can get your, uh, this thing ready, audio yeah, visual. Yeah, yeah, it's already ready? Okay, okay, okay. okay. Anyway, it's three minutes only. We are going to cut him at three. I'll start. Uh, hello, everyone present here. Uh, let me walk you through a case, uh, for the approach of a case of retinal vasculitis through a resident's eye, what you should and what you should not miss. Myself, Dr. Jenikson Jairaj, PG resident, AIMS Bhuvaneshwar. Retinal vasculitis is an inflammatory disease of the blood vessels of the retina that may be associated with primary ocular conditions or with inflammatory or infectious disease in other parts of the body. So here, I'm presenting a 21-year-old male with complaints of painless diminution of vision in the left eye. He had a positive history of contact with the tuberculosis case, and on examination, his vision was 1 by 60 with no improvement in the left eye, and the color vision was 1 by 25 in the left eye, and there was no relative of pupillary defect, and the anterior chamber cell showed plus 0.5 cells. On fundus examination, the right side fundus was normal, and the left side fundus showed the disc being normal, and the infratemporal arcade of vein that showed superficial hemorrhages, exudate, and perivascular infiltrate. And macular edema with exudate in the form of macular star was also seen. So coming with this clinical picture, the first, um, the clinical picture and the diagnosis, see, these are the clinical pictures that I got. That is vision loss, uh, macular star, sectorial superficial retinal hemorrhages, perivascular infiltrates, exudation, and leakage. So what all the differential diagnosis that I could think as a first-year resident. So first that came into my mind, 
it could be a branch retinal vein occlusion because it was there was sectorial superficial retinal hemorrhages. Then I went on to my seniors where they had combined the vision loss with the macular star and they told it might be neuroretinitis too. But optic disc swelling was missing. So finally we went up to the faculty and there they gave us the diagnosis of retinal vasculitis. And then we uh, sent the patient for a battery of investigations with a routine blood test and a Mantoux test was done which came out to be strongly positive. A chest x-ray was done which was clear and a syphilis serology was also done. And the patient was treated with corticosteroid, anti-tubercular therapy, and on follow-up, the patient has developed a tractional retinal detachment. So for that, scatter laser treatment was done. After two months of follow-up, the patient developed vision in the left eye to 6-9, and the color vision was improved to 25 by 25, and there is no RAPD and anterior chamber square. You can very well see there is decrease in the inflammation in the fundus. So, as a resident, what are you supposed to look for in a case of retinal vasculitis? First, it is the type of vessel, then the size of the vessel, the morphology of the perivascular infiltrate, and any associated ocular sign. Coming to the type of vessel, it could be either the artery, vein, or involvement of the bone. In case of an artery, it could be idiopathic retinal vasculitis, aneurysm, and neuroretinitis associated syndrome, or it could be systemic lupus erythematosus, or it could be polyarthritis nodosa. These are few examples that I'm giving you, which are commonly seen. And when it comes to a vein, it could be tuberculosis, Eels disease, which is a hypersensitivity to tuberculosis, or sarcoidosis, or it could be Bechet's disease too. When it involves both artery and vein, it could be ANCA-associated disorders like granulomatous with polyangitis and frosted branch angitis. Coming to specific perivascular infiltrative morphology, like hyaluronic plaques, which are whitish segmental plaques that can be seen in infective etiologies like CMV retinitis and in toxoplasma and TB uh, retinal vasculitis. And frosted branch angiitis could also be seen in most commonly in CMV retinitis. And associated ocular signs. In this ocular signs, the subvascular lesion could be specifically considered for a case of TB retinitis or a TB retinal vasculitis. Candle wax drippings can be seen in cases of uh, sarcoidosis. Try to wind up, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, coming up to the investigations, fundus fluorescein angiography is a must in these cases. And if you are suspecting a specific etiology, then you can go for specific investigations. And the treatment protocol also includes control of the infection, control of the inflammation, and ancillary treatment for any complications during the follow up. So, the take home message is distinguish the type of vessel involved and the morphology of a perivascular infiltrate to look out for the associated ocular or systemic signs, to perform specific blood investigation when a strong etiology is suspected, and to treat based on the detection of an associated condition and the severity of the, severity of the disease. Thank you. Very good. Uh, can you start the next presentation? Doctor, Thank one you. question for you. Yes. you. I think your Mantoux was positive and yes, your TB Gold was also positive. Yes. Was it done, TB Gold? Quantifier okay. TB Gold was not done. No. So we was did. it treated with ATT? Antituvercular no. therapy was given? No. no. Okay. ATT was given. Ah, ATT was given. Just on Mantu. Ah, yes. yes. We have done a presumptive diagnosis of uh, clear tuberculosis and we have started. Because, because I had one patient where Mantu was positive, quantiferent TB was positive, still physician did not treat because there was no symptom. No, uh, see, uh, no, that's a whole new, I mean, that the whole session is required for discussion. But to start TB treatment, we don't need a positive Mantu, we don't need a positive TB gold. We just need a suggestive clinical picture. That's it. So the physician has no business to refuse starting ATT if you want it. Okay. You have to change the physician, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shivan, please. Good afternoon. My. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm presenting a case of a 20-year-old male present in our OPD. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm presenting a case of a 20-year-old male presented in an OPD with a chief complaint of sudden diminution of vision in the right eye for one day. Diminution of vision was marked, painless in nature, and patient experienced mild blurring of vision in the right eye since last 10 days, but the patient ignored the symptoms. There was a positive history of hematuria, four episodes in the last six months. There was no significant personal history. 
For the hematuria, patient was treated with a tablet, norfloxacin plus tenidazole combination two months back. Ocular examination was done. Position of head, eyebrows, lacrimal apparatus were within normal limit. Uncorrected visual acuity of right eye was 1 by 60, less than N36, and left eye it was 6 fix and N6. Entire segment examination was within normal limit, except right eye grade 1 RAPD was, uh, grade 3 RAPD was present. Fundus examination was done with indirect ophthalmoscopy. Left eye was within normal limit. Right eye, disc was hyperemic with splinter hemorrhage was present. Dilated tortures and engorged retinal veins were present and a whitish appearing retina was present along the distribution of celioretinal artery suggestive of celioretinal artery occlusion. So as it was a case of vessel occlu vascular occlusion in a young patient, investigations were done accordingly. Baseline investigation were normal. Serum homocysteine and coagulation profile were within normal limit. As the patient was giving a history of hematuria and there was hyperemic disc and few cells were also present in the vitreous, inflammatory pathology etiology was suspected, so connective tissue dis uh, disorder profile was done and investigation came out negative except C. anca that came out positive. Patient was referred to the immunologist and there the pati uh, patient was advised X-ray paranasal sinuses because the patient was giving a history of recurrent sinusitis and headache. Complete opification of axillary sinus on the right side and partial uh, opification with bony destruction on the left side was noted. On the basis of this, diagnosis of celioretinal artery occlusion secondary to vaginal granulomatosis was made. Patient was treated accordingly with IV methyl prednisolone 1 gram for 3 days, tablet prednisolone 1 mg per kg per day with slow taper and tablet cyclophosphamide 1 mg per kg per day. After 4 weeks of treatment, this was the result. Uncorrected visual equity improved from 1 by 60 to 624. So to uh, this, uh, vaginal granulomatosis is a distinct systemic clin uh, clinical pathological entity characterized by granulomatous vasculitis of upper and lower respiratory tract with frequent involvement of kidney. Ocular involvement occur in 50% of patients. Ocular involvement with scleritis, episcleritis more common than vascular occlusion, vasculitis and retinitis as evident by various landmark studies done on ocular manifestation of vaginal granulomatosis in which retinal artery or vein occlusion, vasculitis and retinitis is a rare presentation. So the take home message in, message in this, uh, when a young patient is presenting with vascular, vascular occlusion, uh, we should always rule out, uh, we should always connective, uh, connective tissue disorder and inflammatory pathology once the baseline investigation is normal. Thank you. Okay, I'll just mention one small tip. Uh, Wegner's granulomatosis is now called granulomatosis with polyangitis. Huh? Uh, because uh, Friedrich Wegner, who basically discovered the disease, had some Nazi connections here. Yeah. So you should always mention the newer names. Huh? Very good. And uh, basically the take home message is any young person with vascular occlusion, apart from the regular diabetes hypertension, we have to look for the entire immunological profile, SLE, sarcoid, uh, vaginas, and uh, even uh, COVID nowadays, and uh, HIV. HIV is very important. So there should be a protocol where you will <laughs> test for every patient. These particular tests will be done. Uh, post vaccination also be stored yes, patients. yes. One thing is also very important, it can be isolated ciliaretinal artery occlusion or it, it has to be associated with uh, AION, especially in Wagner's disease. It could be. Yeah. So you have to, con your picture was also uh, indicating towards that only, your fundus picture. This was quite edematous and it was hyperemic. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so possibly. Perimetry would have, sure. okay, we'll go to the next case. Very good case, doctor. Very good. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My case presentation is on combo plan for management of macular edema in BRBO. So I have got no financial disclosures. Next, please. So this is my case. A 49 years old male patient with no systemic comorbidities visited the outpatient department in July 2019 with complaint of diminution of vision in left eye. So detailed ophthalmological examination in right eye was all normal. Left eye showed a BCVA of 6 by 18 partial. Fundus showed retina on, disc was 0.4 and it showed ITBRVO with macular edema. Next. So 
this is the fundus picture and this is the OCT picture of left eye. So based on the clinical findings and the investigation findings, we plan to give him injection ranibizumab first dose intravitreal. So first dose was given in July 2019. Then we again checked for um, OCT and everything. It was a non-resolving macular edema. So second dose of ranibizumab was given in September 2019. The macular edema did not come down. So the third dose of injection ranibizumab was given in November 2019. After these three doses, the edema did not resolve, so we change our plan of treatment to the next FDA-approved drug, that is aflibercept. First dose of aflibercept was given in January 2020. The edema did not come down, so the second dose of aflibercept was given in March 2020. The edema still did not come down, so the third dose of aflibercept was given in June. Now we see in the graph that the edema has come down, but again there was a recurrence of edema. So now again we had to change the plan of treatment. We gave him an intravitreal uh, dexamethasone implant in August. Now the edema started coming down and when there were no hemorrhages, we planned to supplement it with targeted focal laser PHC. Now our patient was edema free for almost six months. This is the fluorescein angiogram of left eye which confirmed ITBRVO and this is a picture of targeted argon laser in left eye. Next slide. This is the dexamethasone implant in November and in December 2020. Now in 2021, the again the edema started coming. So, Ozodex second implant was given in February. Now the edema has come down. There was no edema till July, but again the CMT started increasing. So the third Ozodex implant was given in September. Again, the patient was edema free for three, four months. Now in next year, that is in 2022, again the patient present with edema. So again, we had to give him the fourth implant of Ozodex. During all this uh, Ozodex implant, we checked the IOP and we checked for cataract. The, the IOP was maintained. There was no cataract. And after the fourth implant, the patient was edema free for nine months. But when the patient presented to us in November 2022, now there was a sudden drop in BCVA. There was a recurrence of macular edema and huge CMT of 614. And here the patient has started developing cataract. So we had to discontinue uh, dexamethasone implantation and we switched to another therapy that is injection brolucizumab. First dose intravitreal we gave and then in December the patient followed up, the edema had come down, the BCVA had improved. Now this is the case, sum case summary of all four years about the macular edema and what all treatments were given. Now this is a long follow-up case of BRVO with recurrent macular edema with multiple treatment options but our patient was refractory to most of these. Now, literature says that ranibizumab and aflibercept are FDA-approved antivegers for treatment of macular edema in BRVO. There are many clinical trials to show the same. But our patient was refractory to both of these, so he had to be switched to other modalities. Now, regarding intravitreal steroids and focal laser, intravitreal dexamethasone implant was FDA-approved in 2009. And in comparison, studies of dexamethasone with ranibizumab, initially in the first two months, both has an equal efficacy, but in long term, ranibizumab showed superior results. And there was a BVO study for focal laser. It significantly improves visual acuity in such patients, but they have a lesser efficacy as compared to anti -vages. Our case was edema free for almost six to nine months after each dexamethasone implant, but the edema recurred. And at last, he started developing cataracts, so we had to switch him. Now regarding intravitreal brolucizumab. It is FDA please approved. Please summarize. Please summarize. We are using ARMD. It is an off-label use in BRVO, and there was only one case reported in literature regarding this. And there was a Raptor clinical trial which was going on, but it was terminated in 2021 in stage three due to increased incidences of retinal vasculitis. So we had to discuss all these pros and cons with our patient, and then we injected him with brolucizumab. So to summarize, there are no control studies investigating the effect of combination therapy and refractory cases need newer off-label anti but it should be done with extreme caution. So now I open up the hall for discussion. I have three questions. When the cataract has to be removed, what next? If the edema again recurs, what next? And do surgical therapies like vitrectomy and all have a role in this? Okay, doctor, I am not able to understand what is surprising. You seem very surprised by the edema recurring. Yeah. Uh, we would be more surprised if it was not recurring. Because we do expect, once you have a vein occlusion, this is for life. So uh, day in and day out, uh, all our patients keep coming. That's not surprising, that is expected. Second, I don't understand is why you stopped Ozodex simply because you had cataract. 
you were already anticipating cataract once you started ozodex yeah. so just do the cataract surgery and continue ozodex because it was giving you a good response i don't know why you changed because there was no uh, steroid response in terms of the iop, IOP rise. Yeah. so you had no contraindication actually now you shifted to a more dangerous drug which can actually cause retinal That's vascular right. occlu occlusion and a neovascular glaucoma so there was no need, need for you to change at all well, we could have continued Abs you should continue okay. and, uh, bcva was uh, with the uh, change in cm like the edema was coming bcva was constant or was it deteriorating it was deteriorating when every time yeah every time then because again it was coming because to because only if edema is coming if it is only irf then you can still wait if it is not a srf or uh, sub rp fluid in case of rbos only IRF, if it is not affecting the vision, then you should not keep on injecting just for mm -hmm. drying no, up BCV the No, BCVA was also coming down. Okay, Patient so was that should have mentioned. It is yeah. only based on CMT. Yeah. Okay, we go to no, the next talk now. The yeah, my point is to just repeat an FFA, CEDA area of ischemia. Yeah. If there is ischemia is progressing, you can do some selective grid laser through the ischemic area. Uh, repeat intravitreal uh, zodex or uh, anti VGF. And if there is any macular fraction is there, then you can plan uh, 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 for surgical intervention. Thank you. Dr. Abhishek. Nobody is there from the Thanks. next session. Yeah. Let's just not ready. Good evening. I don't see any faculty from the next session. Is there anybody here already? Nobody. So we'll discuss these cases if nobody comes for the next session. After this presentation, we will discuss the cases. Yeah. Ma'am, we started eight minutes late also no, no, that's here. That's fine, but so there's nobody here. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Presentation. Yeah. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. My topic for today. Presentation is one. Okay. Okay. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. My topic for today's presentation is my experience of prolisizumab in a case of idiopathic CNVM. I have no financial disclosures and conflict of interest. So my patient, 25-year-old male, an associate in consulting firm by occupation presented in OPRI with a chief complaint of diminution of vision, left eye, six months. He had no any past history of systemic illness or any medication or any history of trauma. Patient was pre previously diagnosed as a case of idiopathic CNVM with SRF in left eye diagnosed elsewhere for which we ha he had received intravitreal bevacizumab there. So on examination, a BCV of 6 by 6 in right eye and 636 in left eye was noted. Rest all external findings were within normal limits. Fundoscopic evaluation revealed a dull FR, uh, a dull FR probably a idiopathic CNVM with big SRF and PD. So OCT evaluation confirmed the presence of CNVM and SRF. Patient was somehow not satisfied with the previous treatment regime and wanted to go for the best options available with us. So we advised him to go for intravitreal injection of brolicizumab and monthly follow up was advised. So uh, three month follow up after the first dose, BCVA left eye still 6 by 36 but still uh, but anatomical improvement seen, SRF has decreased, PED still remains the same. Now three month follow up after seven, uh, second dose, the BCVA 6 by 18 with near complete resolution of SRF, patient was advised to go for the third dose and after the third dose we can see there is complete SRF resolution, CNVM is still there. Uh, so. Uh, Three intravitreal injections of brolicizumab were given at an interval of three months each between injections, achieving a final visual acuity of 6 by 6. Hence, we conclude uh, that uh, intravitreal injection of brolicizumab has a good res uh, resolution in cases of idiopathic CNVM with SRF non resolving with other molecules. This is the fundus pick uh, of the patient after uh, this uh, uh, giving uh, after three doses of uh, brolicizumab. So uh, something about brolicizumab is a humanized monoclonal single chain uh, fragment that binds with uh, VGFA, has a molecular weight of 26 kilodaltons by attaching to VGF brolicizumab inhibits the activation of VGF receptors, decreases neo neovascularization in the eye. It is currently FD approved for the treatment of neovascular ARMD and has a T half of three days. It readily penetrates the RP in choroid and the serum concentrations is less than six times six thousand times than that of the vitreous concentrations that is all thank you ma'am the, the the uh, uh, okay okay so he was you said he was somehow not satisfied yeah. that is nothing did you have an indication for shifting the drug did you have no, an he indication said that, uh, he, he said is not the question you have to decide uh, uh, the last the yes Yes. Uh, there the recorded visual acuity was 636 and after the injection also the recorded visual acuity. Visual acuity may not change. 
point is, was there any evidence of activity, fluid, RP detachment, which was not resolving with brevisuzumab? Do you have any such evidence before you shift to brevisuzumab? So don't shift a patient uh, to a potentially risky drug, which can cause blindness, uh, based on any, without having any evidence of lack of efficacy. Brolisuzumab has a problem of uh, intraocular inflammation, you know. Uh, moreover, when you shifted to Paginex or Brolisuzumab, uh, you said that you have given the injection at three monthly interval. No. CNVM. So, uh, why didn't you give the loading dose of three injection? You could have uh, got a better result. One month uh, uh, loading dose as per Harrier and Hawk study, and then three monthly. So first thing is you should have had evidence of inefficacy of bevacizumab, which you don't have. Second is then there are other drugs to shift to like ranibizumab, like aflibercept, and then you go to brolisizumab if at all nothing is working, which is very rare. No, post bevacizumab. He has used post bevacizumab. Mic to Dedo Jakui Bolta, not even listening. Yeah, so uh, if there are any questions from the uh, audience, anything at all related to the last session? Nothing, okay. Anybody comments? Anyone? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, respected panelists of the session. I hope everyone enjoyed. So we are going to start.